the circuit. It was that time of year again. Ito, the strawberry sharecropper, did not smile. It was natural. The peak of the strawberry season was over, and in the last few days the workers, most of them braceros, were not picking as many boxes as they had during June and July. As the last days of August disappeared, so did the number of braceros. Sunday, only one, the best picker, came to work. I liked him. Sometimes we talked during our half-hour lunch break. That is how I found out he was from Jalisco, the same state in Mexico my family was from. That Sunday was the last time I saw him. When the sun had tired and sunk behind the mountains, Ito signaled us that it was time to go home. Ya es hora, he yelled in his broken Spanish. Those were the words I waited for, twelve hours a day, every day, seven days a week, week after week. And the thought of not hearing them again saddened me. As we drove home, Papa did not say a word. With both hands on the wheel, he stared at the dirt road. My older brother, Roberto, was also silent. He leaned his head back and closed his eyes. Once in a while, he cleared from his throat the dust that blew in from outside. Yes, it was that time of year. When I opened the front door to the shack, I stopped. Everything we owned was neatly packed in cardboard boxes. Suddenly, I felt even more the weight of hours, days, weeks, and months of work. I sat down on a box. The thought of having to move to Fresno and knowing what was in store for me there brought tears to my eyes. That night, I could not sleep. I lay in bed thinking about how much I hated this move. A little before five o'clock in the morning, Papa woke everyone up. A few minutes later, the yelling and screaming of my little brothers and sister, for whom the move was a great adventure, broke the silence of dawn. Soon after, the barking of dogs accompanied them. While we packed the breakfast dishes, Papa went outside to start the carcachita. That was the name Papa gave his old black Plymouth. He had bought it in a used car lot in Santa Rosa. Papa was very proud of his little jalopy. He had a right to be proud of it. He had spent a lot of time looking at other cars before buying this one. When he finally chose the carcachita, he checked it thoroughly before driving it out of the car lot. He examined every inch of the car. He listened to the motor, tilting his head from side to side like a parrot trying to detect any noises that spelled car trouble. After being satisfied with the looks and sounds of the car, Papa then insisted on knowing who the original owner was. He never did find out from the car salesman, but he bought the car anyway. Papa figured the original owner must have been an important man, because behind the rear seat of the car, he found a blue necktie. Papa parked the car out in front and left the motor running. Listo, he yelled. Without saying a word, Roberto and I began to carry the boxes out to the car. Roberto carried the two big boxes, and I carried the two smaller ones. Papa then threw the mattress on top of the car and tied it with ropes to the front and rear bumpers. Everything was packed except Mama's pot. It was an old, large, galvanized pot she had picked up at an army surplus store in Santa Maria. The pot had many dents and nicks, and the more dents and nicks it acquired, the more Mama liked it. Mi olla, she used to say proudly. I held the front door open as Mama carefully carried out her pot by both handles, making sure not to spill the cooked beans. When she got to the car, Papa reached out to help her with it. Roberto opened the rear car door, and Papa gently placed it on the floor behind the front seat. All of us then climbed in. Papa sighed wiped the sweat from his forehead with his sleeve, and said wearily, Es todo. As we drove away, I felt a lump in my throat. I turned around and looked at our little shack for the last time. At sunset, we drove into a labor camp near Fresno. Since Papa did not speak English, Mama asked the camp foreman if he needed any more workers. We don't need no more, said the foreman, scratching his head. Jeff was Sullivan down the road. Can't miss him. 
He lives in a big white house with a fence around it. When we got there, Mama walked up to the house. She went through a white gate, past a row of rose bushes, up the stairs to the house. She rang the doorbell. The porch light went on and a tall husky man came out. They exchanged a few words. After the man went in, Mama clasped her hands and hurried back to the car. We have work. Mr. Sullivan said we can stay there the whole season, she said, gasping and pointing to an old garage near the stables. The garage was worn out by the years. It had no windows, the walls eaten by termites, strained to support the roof full of holes. The dirt floor, populated by earthworms, looked like a gray road map. That night, by the light of a kerosene lamp, we unpacked and cleaned our new home. Roberto swept away the loose dirt, leaving the hard ground. Papa plugged the holes in the walls with old newspapers and tin can tops. Mama fed my little brothers and sister. Papa and Roberto then brought in the mattress and placed it on the far corner of the garage. Mama, you and the little ones sleep on the mattress. Roberto, Panchito, and I will sleep outside under the trees, Papa said. Early the next morning, Mr. Sullivan showed us where his crop was. And after breakfast, Papa, Roberto, and I headed for the vineyard to pick. Around 9 o'clock, the temperature had risen to almost 100 degrees. I was completely soaked in sweat, and my mouth felt as if I had been chewing on a handkerchief. I walked over to the end of the row, picked up the jug of water we had brought, and began drinking. Don't drink too much. You'll get sick, Roberto shouted. No sooner had he said that than I felt sick to my stomach. I dropped to my knees and let the jug roll off my hands. I remained motionless with my eyes glued on the hot sandy ground. All I could hear was the drone of the insects. Slowly, I began to recover. I poured water over my face and neck and watched the dirty water run down my arms to the ground. I still felt dizzy when we took a break to eat lunch. It was past two o'clock. We sat underneath a large walnut tree that was on the side of the road. While we ate, Papa jotted down the number of boxes we had picked. Roberto drew designs on the ground with a stick. Suddenly, I noticed Papa's face turn pale as he looked down the road. Here comes the school bus, he whispered loudly in alarm. Instinctively, Roberto and I ran and hid in the vineyards. We did not want to get in trouble for not going to school. The neatly dressed boys about my age got off. They carried books under their arms. After they crossed the street, the bus drove away. Roberto and I came out from hiding and joined Papa. Tienen que tener cuidado, he warned us. After lunch, we went back to work. The sun kept beating down. The buzzing insects, the wet sweat, and the hot, dry dust made the afternoon seem to last forever. Finally, the mountains around the valley reached out and swallowed the sun. Within an hour, it was too dark to continue picking. The vines blanketed the grapes, making it difficult to see the bunches. Vamonos, said Papa, signaling to us that it was time to quit work. Papa then took out a pencil and began to figure out how much we had earned on our first day. He wrote down numbers, crossed some out, wrote down some more. Quince, he murmured. When we arrived home, we took a cold shower underneath a water hose. We then sat down to eat dinner around some wooden crates that served as a table. Mama had cooked a special meal for us. We had rice and tortillas with carne con chile, my favorite dish. The next morning, I could hardly move. My body ached all over. I felt little control over my arms and legs. This feeling went on every morning for days until my muscles finally got used to the work. It was Monday, the first week of November. The grape season was over, and I could now go to school. I woke up early that morning and lay in bed, looking at the stars and savoring the thought of not going to work and of starting sixth grade for the first time that year. Since I could not sleep, I decided to get up and join Papa and Roberto at breakfast. I sat at the table across from Roberto, but I kept my head down. I did not want to look up and face him. I knew he was sad. 
He was not going to school today. He was not going tomorrow or next week or next month. He would not go until the cotton season was over, and that was sometime in February. I rubbed my hands together and watched the dry, acid-stained skin fall to the floor in little rolls. When Papa and Roberto left for work, I felt relief. I walked to the top of a small grade next to the shack and watched the carcachita disappear in the distance in a cloud of dust. Two hours later, around eight o'clock, I stood by the side of the road waiting for school bus number 20. When it arrived, I climbed in. Everyone was busy either talking or yelling. I sat in an empty seat in the back. When the bus stopped in front of the school, I felt very nervous. I looked out the bus window and saw boys and girls carrying books under their arms. I put my hands in my pant pockets and walked to the principal's office. When I entered, I heard a woman's voice say, May I help you? I was startled. I had not heard English for months. For a few seconds, I remained speechless. I looked at the lady who waited for an answer. My first instinct was to answer her in Spanish, but I held back. Finally, after struggling for English words, I managed to tell her that I wanted to enroll in the sixth grade. After answering many questions, I was led to the classroom. Mr. Lima, the sixth grade teacher, greeted me and assigned me a desk. He then introduced me to the class. I was so nervous and scared at that moment when everyone's eyes were on me that I wished I were with Papa and Roberto picking cotton. After taking roll, Mr. Lima gave the class the assignment for the first hour. The first thing we have to do this morning is finish reading the story we began yesterday, he said enthusiastically. He walked up to me, handed me an English book, and asked me to read. We are on page 125, he said politely. When I heard this, I felt my blood rush to my head. I felt dizzy. Would you like to read? He asked hesitantly. I opened the book to page 125. My mouth was dry. My eyes began to water. I could not begin. You can read later, Mr. Lima said, understandingly. During recess, I went into the restroom and opened my English book to page 125. I began to read in a low voice pretending I was in class. There were many words I did not know. I closed the book and headed back to the classroom. Mr. Lima was sitting at his desk correcting papers. When I entered, he looked up at me and smiled. I felt better. I walked up to him and asked if he could help me with the new words. Gladly, he said. The rest of the month, I spent my lunch hours working on English with Mr. Lima my best friend at school. One Friday, during lunch hour, Mr. Lima asked me to take a walk with him to the music room. Do you like music? He asked me, as we entered the building. Yes, I like corridos, I answered. He then picked up a trumpet, blew on it, and handed it to me. The sound gave me goosebumps. I knew that sound. I had heard it in many corridos. How would you like to learn how to play it? He asked. He must have read my face, because before I could answer, he added, I'll teach you how to play it during our lunch hours. That day, I could hardly wait to tell Papa and Mama the great news. As I got off the bus, my little brothers and sisters ran up to meet me. They were yelling and screaming. I thought they were happy to see me, but when I opened the door to our shack, I saw that everything we owned was neatly packed in cardboard boxes.